Good evening and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Rashmita and I'm the event planner for Microsoft Reactor Bengaluru, India. The session will run over the next 60 minutes, including Q&A. The chat will be open throughout and we do encourage you all to participate. Before we start today's session, please take a moment to read our code of conduct. We are all here to learn, so please be respectful, mindful, be friendly, and be patient to each other. I would now like to welcome Vivek, our speaker for today's session. Vivek is a tech enthusiast and an open source contributor with around 15 years of experience in the software industry. He works at Microsoft as a senior cloud advocate. But for now, I will hand over to Vivek to begin the session. Over to you, Vivek. Hey, Rishmada, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me share my screen. There's a bunch of things we are going to discuss today. Let me add. Yes, so here we are. So welcome all to samosachai.net. Uh, this is an amazing uh, series which we are running. And uh, the next few sessions will be focused on microservices. And we started with microservices last week. So without wasting my time, I'm going to spend some time in terms of what we are learning today. Uh, Nishi is supposed to join me, but he's having some internet issues. So hopefully he'll join me in some time, but I will be taking it further. Cool. So what are we learning today? Uh, last week, uh, we basically uh, built a microservice application. Uh, from a .NET uh, app, we built it and deployed it on the local. And then we went ahead and uh, deployed it uh, onto the, uh, in the you know, as a composer. We built it as a composer and deployed it locally as well. So this, this specific week, what we are going to do is uh, basically learn uh, in a complex orchestrator, which is Kubernetes, what is Kubernetes, why it is required, and what is the need for uh, container management systems, right? And how do how do how does resilience work there? Uh, how do how do you scale and how how exactly it all fits in? And uh, from a demo perspective, we will uh, take the same app uh, which we did last week and take that app and uh, make sure that we create a static representation of that app that is the uh, container image and push push it to the Docker Hub. And uh, obviously, uh, you know, after that, we will deploy it locally uh, from a Kubernetes perspective on Docker Desktop. We're going to deploy it locally, and we will see a couple of use cases, uh, which is re with respect to uh, the scaling and resilient perspective. So, uh, without wasting some time, uh, let me go and share something very interesting thing. Uh, this is an action for everyone, whoever is watching this, um, and I'll. This is the most important thing. This particular, you know, learn modules, which is there is a nine learn modules, uh, which we are uh, working on and we are going to do work, you know, uh, spend some time in the next eight sessions, I believe. And we'll be doing it live as well. We are going to make sure that we show, you know, show this, uh, these learn modules live and, and also perform a couple of actions live. But, uh, we I have created a collection of these learn modules, and uh, if you want to learn end-to-end -end microservice app development, what are the challenges you're going to face uh, from an from an infrastructure resiliency to you know if you want to build a you know a code-based resiliency from a .NET perspective, GitHub Actions, how to build a CI/CD pipelining, and also how do you you know instrument monitoring from Prometheus to 
uh, application insights and various other things, uh, it's all compiled into nine modules. And these nine modules are available out there and just pick it up. Uh, and that is the QR code. That is the link which is out there, which is uh, aka.ms slash net. It's pretty easy to remember. I have 92 days to uh, finish this challenge. So um, each challenge is maybe around, some of them are 30 minutes and some of them are you know one hour. So uh, it's easy to finish. Every week you finish one and you will be uh, surprised to see how many concepts you're going to learn uh, in these uh, modules. By the way, I've, I've been doing this and uh, I feel I have been learning a lot of things uh, from a microservice uh, uh, you know, development perspective, even though I have worked in microservice development previously. So that's something which uh, we will take it up. Uh, so this is something which uh, I have just launched it today. So make sure that you go back and uh, take this up and uh, you know run through the challenge. So that's something which we will do. Cool. So let's uh, go ahead and let me come back to the slides. Perfect. So what is container orchestration? So we did discuss uh, in uh, in the last episode that you know you you have an app and you converted that app into a static representation that is a packaged you packaged it and made sure that you launch that package uh, in you know using docker composer basically the package was nothing but a docker image you created the image we hosted that image somewhere and through uh, through the um, composer you were able to deploy it onto your local machine so but now you know there are different services which you have from a microservice perspective all these services might uh, have different kinds of requirement in terms of scale perspective right uh, so container orchestration is nothing but uh, you should be able to dynamically scale your app which means uh, say for example you have an order service and uh, you are running uh, some kind of a campaign uh, with respect to people going back and ordering some of these uh, some of these uh, uh, you know you know using this application they are ordering some uh, something from the shopping cart so you need to make sure when there is a lot of traffic on the order service the order service has to scale so that is where the you know a container orchestration will come in place and that is what container orchestration will help you in right so there is bunch of containers which you have and these containers needs to be scaled and also scaled down when there is no requirement as well if there is no much traffic it has to scale down if there is traffic it has to be scaled up that is something is one of the main uh, goal of the uh, container orchestrators and then there is automatic updates right so when we, when we when we talk about automatic updates in microservice um, the most important thing is the microservice are are decoupled and each of these microservices need to be updated individually so there are a couple of services which are running and uh, you know you are making a change to the code for specifically for a coupon service or for specifically for a catalog service. And those services need to be updated uh, and without even uh, making, without making any kind of um, hindrance to the other services which is running. And, and also it is, it is basically, a, it's kind of a strategy you need to follow to update these, uh, these containers as well it's not like every container you can just replace it like that you need to have uh, different kind of uh, strategies like liveness probes uh, readiness probes and other things from the kubernetes perspective which we'll talk about it because that is the main goal of orchestrator so i'm just talking about orchestrator as of now and not introduced kubernetes yet so just think about a couple of use cases of orchestrator and that's where container management also comes into picture that means you need to make sure your infrastructure is organized. You need to make sure that now you know there is a way to update, you are to roll back. There is a way to uh, manage and help you know uh, make sure that you are also managing the health of these containers and other things. So everything comes in a it's a very complex system. So you need to make sure uh, the orchestrator helps you build it in a complex system, and uh, orchestrator is looking at. Uh, looking looking at all of these things uh, through various different strategies it has. So we're wasting time. Uh, let me introduce uh, Kubernetes. 
So Kubernetes uh, is bit, let me first you know, get the diagram for you all so that it's easy for us to see. It looks like something happened. Let me just take this up. Yep. So you can see this. Um, let me increase the size. Okay. So what is Kubernetes? So Kubernetes is uh, uh, basically a tool to manage your containers and, and orchestrate your containers. It has two different roles. The container management, which I talked about, the dynamically scaling and, and uh, automatic updates uh, and health monitoring and other things which it provides. On top of that, Kubernetes basically provides you a very, uh, very important thing, which is man you know, infrastructure management as well. It is, it is also making sure that your workload is managed. It is isn't creating an abstract layer on top of the infrastructure so that you are, you are able to uh, manage your infrastructure as seamlessly managing the infrastructure for these container workloads. So that is, that is the main uh, role of Kubernetes in terms of building and uh, deploying your applications. But, uh, you know, how exactly this works, right? Uh, basically, Kubernetes is a declarative uh, tool. It's not an imperative tool. When when I say declarative tool, it means that uh, you have a uh, specific uh, app, uh, you know, the YAML file, uh, where you are defining your desired state. What is your desired state? So what you are telling is, this is how I want my infrastructure to be. This is these are the number of uh, containers I want to run. These are the number of, uh, you know, this is the number of you know, the resources. That means the CPU and uh, the compute I need to use for these specific uh, containers. So though this is this is what we are doing in terms of uh, building these, uh, you know, building these Kubernetes specific uh, code, right? So you are building an YAML file, and this is a desired state. You are designing it, and once you are designed it. What you will do is you'll go and you know uh, make sure that you supply it to the control plane. If you see here, it there is a master, there is uh, worker nodes which are agent nodes in this diagram. Uh, control plane is the master node. As a user, you're going to use a client which is kubectl to supply the desired state, which is uh, nothing but a YAML file where you have all the configurations. You're going to copy all these configurations and go back and hand it over to the API server. And what happens in, in API server? So the API server takes in the uh, takes in the YAML file and it handovers to the control manager and control manager decodes it and it says, okay, this is the state we want to be in and uh, takes the help of scheduler and exit and make sure it works with kubelet, which is which is nothing but here, which is which is in the worker node. Uh, which is a simple binary, which is which is running in the in the worker node. Uh, it is talking to the master node. That is where the connect happens. It is sh sharing all the health. Exit is having all the health as from a database perspective, and it is taking scheduler is taking all the details from the control manager using Exit. It schedules all these uh, desired state. And just note that there is something called as pods in these uh, specific uh, agents. And now the Pods are nothing but uh, in a group of containers, or it's just a container. It is a single unit of uh, you know uh, you know application running in uh, Kubernetes, right? It is the basic unit. So just remember this: uh, it's a user-defined state, and we're going to see a couple of demos as well. So it's a user-defined state, and you're taking that state and handing it over to control plane. That is where the power of Kubernetes comes in. It's a declarative tool. Uh, so you are declaring it, and it takes in the declaration and make sure it make it maintains that state. So that is the role of Kubernetes. And it obviously while uh, also managing the containers. So container orchestration and infrastructure abstraction, it provides you both. And you're doing, uh, you know, uh, you're making sure that you are running a scalable application uh, with with these uh, with these setup. Okay, so that's what community is all about, and this is very important for the next few episodes of Summer Sachai. The reason is 
we are going to deploy a real world uh, you know microservice application with uh, with everything with rapidmq and with all the other uh, components which is required and through those episodes we'll have uh, a lot of discussions around uh, how to manage the resiliency from infrastructure service mesh and we you know the uh, poly and uh, prometheus and other things so uh, this is very important to know that you know uh, understanding understanding kubernetes is very important for next few sessions which we are going to have so this is the reason why uh, i'm making sure that uh, we spend some time in terms of learning this uh, but let me go I'll go to the next slide you know just spend a couple of minutes on to There's some issue with the. Okay, cool. So, net net, the benefit of using Kubernetes is is to uh, self heal. So if the if you have a can if you have a container running, uh, you delete the container or the container is crashed or something. There is a self healing mechanism uh, in Kubernetes, and scaling. You can also uh, specify how to scale through the YAML file, the configuration file, which we are going to supply to the Kubernetes, where you're going to provide all the details which is required from a um, number of uh, containers you want to uh, have at the maximum. And also you can also specify the minimum containers you want to have and various other configurations you can do. And as I told you, the most important thing about uh, container management is 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 also about rolling updates and rollbacks. So you should also have a rollback mechanism. You should also have a rolling, uh, you know, rolling updates mechanism, and and also different strategies of uh, how do you roll these uh, roll these containers as well. And then obviously uh, storage and the how the network is uh, managed and various information storing like the security and other things which is uh, through secrets and other things. So there is a couple of uh, benefits uh, of using uh, Kubernetes. These are a couple of things which I can say because there is much of uh, benefits which we can discuss uh, uh, from a benefits perspective. Uh, but from a, from today's demo perspective and from, uh, from the microservice perspective, these are the three things which uh, we will be looking at. You know, the how does it self heals and we will see some scenarios with respect to scaling and we will see uh, how uh, we can you know uh, roll updates as well so a couple of actions for developers here um here is a workshop uh, it's it's a 2 hours workshop uh, which covers a couple of things you know uh, if you see the workshop you know it's it it does a multi container uh, application dev and a deployment on Azure Kubernetes service so if you want to learn kubernetes in depth i i believe this workshop uh, is a real good example of that uh, because you know it's 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 not just uses public cloud but also it uses uh, the let's encrypt it uses different ingress uh, you know nginx as an ingress uh, and there is uh, you know a couple of um, certification management which is respect to security and other things so go back and try it out uh, yourself so you can go back and uh, execute these uh, learn module so that's something which uh, i would definitely suggest you to take it forward cool so knowledge check perspective so uh, every session we have this knowledge check uh, we are so question to the audience so why is a container orchestrator useful in a microservice architecture you could answer uh, in the in the chat and uh, that would be really cool so each either you know each microservice needs to be maintained scaled and deployed individually an orchestrator helps manage those tasks uh, b is uh, an orchestrator holds instructions uh, on how to build and deploy uh, the sorry uh, deploy the docker images an orchestrator is is the only means by which to run a containerized application in the cloud so which is the right answer so people go ahead and uh, answer in the chat uh, let let's discuss that as well I'm getting a couple of answers, couple of answers. Cool. Most of them I've answered A, which is really cool. Yes, A is the right answer. And I will go ahead and say yes, because, uh, because you know, you know, microservice needs to be maintained separately. 
right? And uh, it it also requires how how you do, how do you scale it and how do you deploy it? As I told you, right? Um, that when you deploy a particular uh, set of version of uh, a service, say for example the order service, uh, the catalog service must not be disturbed. It has to run as its own, and it has its own version ma version management system, and it has to run it run on its own. So that's what uh, that's what it means here. So let's take that up, and that's cool. So bunch up your answer, yeah, cool stuff. Let's go to next section. So it's done, right? We mean like now we know uh, what is container management. We need to uh, scale. We need to dynamically update and various things we need to do. Now we understand what is Kubernetes is. Basically, it's an orchestrator. It also abstracts the infrastructure layer, and that's how you use inf you know, uh, Kubernetes for. And we will see a couple of use cases uh, like the scaling part, resilient part of Kubernetes. So let me you know, jump into deep dive into the uh, demo part of it. So let's go to the learn module, which I am executing, right? So this is the learn module, which I'm executing. I did, I did uh, share this learn module before. Uh, if you have and you haven't got this, uh, let me share it again. Um uh, this is where you can find the learn module as well. So just go there and pick this learn module. Now that's the link there. Uh that's one it. Cool. So so in this learn module, it, it's about a couple of things. We did understand what is orchestrator and everything. So I'll just go to the exercises and I will just run these exercises as well. For, to start with. What we're going to have is we obviously we need uh, a Docker desktop here and Visual Studio and a desktop Docker des you know, Docker Hub account uh, to push your images to the Docker Hub. Uh, what we will see here is we're going to you know it's basically about uh, Pizza Shop, which which we built last time as well. There is a Pizza Shop, and there is a bunch of um, you know uh, pizzas which is out there. It's an inventory of pizzas. There is a catalog of catalog service of pizzas, and you can buy pizzas and other things. So this is a code base which you can clone and you can get started with. So I have uh, I have already cloned this and I have made a couple of changes to it, and you will know why I have made a couple of changes to it. Um, but the way uh, the learn module works is there is already a code base for you to go back and execute. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So I already have cloned it, so I have. The clone with me, so let me go to the clone. Just the demo today. So I have this clone with me. Okay, I have the code base, and it's on. Let's also try and open the code in in the Visual Studio Code. So that's on my other screen. Let me bring that here. Cool. Okay, you can see a couple of things. Let me close all of this. Cool. So I hope you can see my screen. Cool. Okay. So I have cloned it. So I have the code base in my uh, in my laptop. So now what we are going to do is th we did this last time as well. So a couple of things which we did last time was to you know do a build a Docker composer. So we packaged it as a composer. So we have services multiple. So composers are used to, uh, you know, package multiple containers together and run it, right? So this is what we have done. So we'll just I'll just copy the composer, and go to the code base which we have, and I'll just run this uh, Docker composer up. But even before I run this, let me show you what images I have. 
but I don't have any images with respect to the code which I'm going to build, right? So there is this is a Docker desktop images. So these are all my images, which is not nothing to do with this demo. So let me go back again and copy this Docker composer out, compose up, sorry, compose build. Uh, even before you bring it up, you need to build it. So I'm just building it. So I've just built the code and Docker images. So you can see here, I have two images, which is ready. So this is nothing but a static representation of the code. So I have the code and I've packaged it and I've just brought this code, uh, you know, just build this code. This is package this code, right? So now it is up and running. So the package uh, has been, uh, the package is ready for us to go back and run uh, Compose up. So let's go and run this one and see what happens it in the detach mode okay so now i have container running the backend container and the front end container both running and if i go to my uh, images i have the images there cool and i have if i do the ps i have front end and back end running I have PSF and A, everything is running fine. So let us go back here and see in the local host. So here it is. So the reason why I changed the code is, is to make sure that I build something for Samosa instead of going back and building something for, uh, for the uh, pizza shop, you know, pizza shop is there, but let I made some couple of changes in the code uh, just to make sure it is samosa and a couple of samosas has been added here. Uh, by the way, I, in, interesting that you know these samosas do exist and you can see these samosas there and how we can build these samosas as well. Anyways, uh, this is this is the application which is running in local from a Docker Compose perspective, but we need to go back and execute this in terms of not just Compose, but just go back here to my exercise. Right now, we are, we are still on the local, right? We need to go and deploy this onto the Kubernetes perspective, right? Kubernetes. So let, us, let me log in to Docker login. So let's see what happens when I do the Docker login. So I have an account, so it is checking for the credentials and it's up, so I'm up. You should have personal tokens, but I'm not using it, but you should. So cool, I'm up there and we need to tag this. So basically what we are doing is, we are tagging the version of the image, the static representation of the image which we had built and we are just tagging that uh, image, right? So that is what we are doing. So let me go back and just tag this uh, upper images. I'm just tagging it. Uh, so tagging, you should use your Docker username. Uh, Docker username, which I am going to give is Vivshed is my username, okay? So I'm tagging the, is a front end image, which, is, which I built the latest tagged into uh, my Docker uh, Hub account. So just to make sure that I tag it in this name because I want to make sure that this is what is available on my uh, Docker Hub account, Docker, Docker Hub, which is a registry. And we did talk about registries as well last time. It is basically about you know, uh, holding that, uh, holding the static representation, which are images. It's uh, nothing but a repository where you can uh, host your images, right? So this is this is what I did. Okay, we tagged it, and then we go back and tag the backend service. So let's go back and tag the backend service as well. So what we are going to do now is. this one from a backend perspective. Once I have tagged it, what I should be doing is this, I need to push this particular tag to the Docker Hub, which is the container registry. So let me go back and do that. 
So we already have this. So all I need to do is to provide the my Okay, so it's pushing my image to uh, Docker Hub, which is the container registry for me, right? So that's something which is happening. While that is happening, we'll get this up, okay? So, Sometimes network issues do happen while you're pushing. Hopefully this is fine. Yep, this has gone through. So let me go back and push the back end as well. As of now, I pushed only the front end code. We will push the you know, back end code as well. So we will go through the code again. Uh, okay, while we wait for this to happen, let me show you the code. So it has the backend code, uh, which has controller, you know, which which has a couple of uh, code in terms of managing the different things. Uh, and then we have front-end code, uh, which is to manage the front-end. So these are two different services, which uh, ideally, uh, in ideal scenario, these are the not services which, we, which we're going to share. Uh, this is the two code which we are deploying. And you can also see there is Compose uh as well and in this uh compose we have you know how it has been built what's the image name and what is the environment and you're also making sure that post and other things so this is from a compose perspective right right now what we have done is just used uh, you know, compose file to build it and once we have built it we have pushed this into the docker uh, registry now, it, now the package is there in the Docker registry. I'll show you how exactly this is filling in the Docker registry as well. So this is my hub. And if I go to my hub and see this, you know, see this hub code, you have two, uh, two different uh, packages, which is here, right? This is this updated two minutes ago, updated a minute ago. So all this came in now. So now uh, the these are the two files which I'm going to pick. Uh, these are two images which I'm going to pick and uh, ex you know, push it to the Kubernetes as well. So let me go back to this. So we have done with this part of the exercise. Now what is most important thing is go and deploy this microservice to the Kubernetes. For this, we, what we are doing is we are using uh, Docker desktop. So what is Docker desktop? Let me open Docker desktop and show you what it is. Let me open that up and push it in my, uh, it's in my other screen. So let me push this up. And cool. So here is Kubernetes. So I can enable this. Uh, if I just enable this, uh, you know, you have uh, Kubernetes, uh, local Kubernetes running. And how do you select that Kubernetes? Basically, uh, you know, you can go to kubectl, which is which is the client which you are supposed to use. Uh, config uh, get context. When you do that, you can see this, the most important thing, right? So, uh, you can see that I can select which con in which context it has to be. The kubectl has to be, right? I have selected this context, which is good. And you can see that kubectl um, uh, get nodes. So it's running on Docker desktop and it, everything is on my uh, Docker desktop, lap in it, which is my laptop, right? Okay, so now let's go and see this file. So now what we will do is uh, we will create the configuration, which is the YAML file, the user desired state uh, in the YAML. So it, this YAML file is already built, but I'm just explaining this. Basically, uh, it's a con you know uh, deployment uh, 
spec uh, for the containers. And what we're doing is, uh, this is where we are specifying a number of containers we want and name of the metadata because at the end of the day, we need to identify these. So we are providing the name and also uh, path to the image, which is my uh, my Docker Hub uh, an image which we created and the port which it is open that is the first part of the spec the second part of the spec is it's more about uh, the service which is the load balancer you need to apply on top of uh, this specific uh, this specific pod with this specific container how do you access it and if you see here it is cluster ip so the reason why it is cluster ip because it's a backend code which I'm deploying. I just don't want to anyone to access this code. So I want to make sure that you know it is it is not available for everyone. It is only available only within the cluster, within the Kubernetes cluster. So that is where uh, you're going to you know, go through the spec and you, you add the service on top of it with cluster IP and also the port on which you can access this. So that is exactly what um, you know this YAML is all about. And this is already available on the, I've already built it. The reason is, ta -da. let's go back in code. So this is the only change we need to make is to add my uh, image path, the details I have added here. And apart from that, there's nothing needs to be added. And rest of the things are already uh, given in the code. So the second part of the spec is already there. Everything is up. And the same way with the front end as well. The front end also has the same deployment kind. It also has the label. It also have provide, you know, we are also providing the details to the container image. We have to specify the container image, uh, where to get the images. And also the some of the environment variables has been set. Uh, but the only change here is, this is accessible you know, for the outside world, you know, the load balancer, uh, and we are adding it with the load balancer and the services. It's, it's basically to make sure that this particular uh, service is available outside. So people can go back and access this or, you know, from the uh, local host with, on which this will be hosted, right? So this is where uh, you know the difference in the deployment script are and this is how you develop the yaml so as i told you the the files which uh, you know you have to provide the desired state and these are the yaml files which are where you're going to add the desired uh, state and you submit this desired state to kubernetes and Kubernetes basically takes this desired state and applies uh, the specific state and makes sure that state is maintained. And the role is of Kubernetes is very, very uh, specific that it, it's, it has to maintain this specific uh, state which we have submitted. So that is that is the uh, basic idea behind uh, this particular, uh, you know, this particular. Uh, code which the yaml file as well and, and and also the kubernetes role is to make sure that it maintains this state so let me go back uh, and we have the yamls now both the yamls are there all we have to do is to uh, you know submit this yaml to kubernetes and as i told you kubectl is is the client which is supposed to unit supposed to submit it so we'll go and submit this and we will take that uh, code and see what happens uh, when you submit it uh, to the Kubernetes. So let's see. I'm just applying the backend first. So you can see that it has created a deployment script. It has added a service. Uh, it has go back and let's on front end. So we will apply changes on the front end part of it. So let's apply front end. So both the things I've applied, the back end and the front end, and you can see kubectl get pod. You can see both the pods are running for me. And you can also see kubectl get services. You can also see there is a back end which is in the cluster, which is not having an external IP. That's what we did the front end, which has a load balancer, and it is available on the local host. And that is, that's what we did. And uh, it's everything is running now. And we will see uh, from the code perspective, we just need to see what's 
ramp what's been running. You see, uh, this is this is running on uh, on the Kubernetes, which is locally, uh, which is deployed on uh, Docker uh, desktop, and the other one is uh, basically running through Docker Composer, right? So that is something which the difference between these two different uh, deployments which we did, and this is very important from a different service perspective. Uh, it's a basic uh, basis based for the next few sessions where we are going to deploy a lot of microservices together, and we're going to add new services on the fly uh, to the list of microservices which are running, and we'll see how to add that. We'll also see how a couple of things uh, we're going to do on top of that as well. So this is how you, you we go and deploy an app uh, to communities locally, and uh, uh, what we will do next is we'll see a couple of examples with respect to scaling. And we'll also see a couple of examples with respect to uh, how we can scale down and scale up as well. So uh, this is an amazing command. Like this is uh, this 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 setting is also available on the code, you know, basically on on the YAML file where you can also specify the number of replicas you want. Also, you can specify uh, the minimum number of replicas you want or the maximum number of replicas you want and other things. So that is something which you can uh, definitely uh, check it out. But um, let me go back and we will we will uh, try and scale uh, this, right? kubectl, get pods. What will happen is there is uh, two pods which is running. But now what we will do is we will in increase the number of pods running on the backend service. Uh, you can do this uh, when there is a lot of traffic into your back, you know, onto your service, and you want to make sure you want to scale this backend service. And just execute this and go back and get pod. You can, you can already see there are a couple of containers being created and a couple of containers been running. Uh, I keep running this and it will have five containers running. So we will learn about how exactly this gets deployed from a liveness probe, readiness probe, and other things in the next session. But this is how uh, Kubernetes does scaling. So this is one of the important container management and management um, uh, feature it, every orchestrator need to have. So that's, that's what uh, the demo is all about. So we have this, and we can also scale down. So Scaling down as well is is the same same command to it, so uh, there's no difference in the command. It's just that the number of replicas which we had we need to do is replica is equal to one. So, and we'll see this. You can see there are a couple of uh, in a couple of uh, pods getting terminated. Uh, that's what it's all. Oh, it was fast. So it got terminated and only two pause which is which is the back end and the front end service is the only one which are running so the you know, the most important thing to understand here is how did it scale up and how did it scale down and there was it was you can also make it seamless uh, like you user need to user did not need to know this and you as a management managing this whole uh, services you also uh, don't need to know this as well because you can easily scale up and scale down uh, these services right so let me go back and uh, you know we we'll, let's see how uh, the resilience work as well in kubernetes right so we have we have seen two services which is out there right two uh, services we will we will go back and delete uh, one of the um, pod, which is front end pod. And we will see, just note down that this is the number uh, reference for the pod and it is running for three minutes now. And we will delete this and it is deleting this particular pod. And as soon as it deletes it, what happens is Kubernetes has to maintain the state. The state has been defined already, has already been submitted to the uh, Kubernetes. So what does Kubernetes do? It will just verify whether the required number of pods are running or not. And the moment it verifies the required number of pods are running or not, it, it just takes that pod number and make sure um, it, de it deploys that pod onto the uh, onto the Kubernetes. So if you see this, uh, you know, you can make this out, right? So there is uh, 
14 seconds uh, within you know it was able to bring it up and there is uh, it's running from 14 seconds and it brings up a different pod number if you, if you notice this the number is different and here the number is different so that is the you know uh, importance of uh, you know uh, of of the kubernetes if a pod crashes uh, there's a new pod which is coming up and this is very seamless right user it does not really have to be worried about that is how you can scale your microservices as well you have a couple of services which is running and these services are uh, being deployed on kubernetes and if one of the pod goes down uh, which is which is nothing but a group of containers uh, which is nothing but e easy to manage containers if it goes down it comes up so that is uh, that's the main um, uh, goal and that's what it does and basically um, this is not a, you know a something which um, it, it's available on the fly and uh, you don't you can configure uh, also like how many seconds you want this up and running as well so these are things uh, which i just wanted to show you this is a small demo small uh, learn module as well so uh, let me go back to these slides um, so let me go back to the slides so what we did was to uh, you know even before i go into the knowledge check what we did is in this previous episode, we learned what is microservices are, and we deployed or we built um, a simple app, uh, which is in a .NET app, and uh, we created uh, container images out of that, and uh, we packaged it as a Docker Compose and uh, packaged it and together, and we made sure it is packaged, and then. Today, what we did was to use that package uh, and create the images, and take these images uh, to docker hub which is the container registry and you know make sure that you use the yaml file to uh, tell the kubernetes what you need to do and once it is done uh, you are able to deploy it onto the kubernetes which is on local everything is on local today uh, but in the next session uh, we will we will be deploying it on azure kubernetes service um, almost uh, five to six service microservices with RabbitMQ and various other databases and other things which is uh, which will be deployed and we will see how how to manage uh, all these uh, different uh, problems you're going to encounter while uh, building and deploying a dotnet app in microservices those those are the things which we are going to see in uh, next few sessions uh, but uh, from today's knowledge check perspective, again, we are here and questions. Uh, why does uh, Kubernetes automatically restart pods uh, that have failed? Uh, a, Kubernetes will maintain the system state as defined in the configuration files no matter what. And uh, Kubernetes will maintain the current system state as, as is when a failure occurs and Kubernetes will not automatically uh, recover, rather it needs to be told too. So, you know, let me know what is the answer. I'm just waiting for answers from the audience. Let's wait and see what does the answer from audience. Let me wait for uh, two more minutes. There are a couple of answers coming in. A, 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 A. There's a lot of people answering A. Is it is it really that? That's the answer. Let's see. Oh yes, <laughs> that's the answer. Yes. So basically, it it, ha it it's the um, no matter what, it communities make sure uh, you the YAML file, the desired state which you have mentioned which you have submitted to the Kubernetes, it is maintained. So that is the role of um, or role of the Kubernetes as well. So well done for people who have answered A, uh, which is really cool. And let me summarize again. This is what we did. Uh, we learned about the orchestrator. We learned about microservices, which we have. And we, you know, we deployed uh, to Kubernetes and we also learned uh, how do you uh, how do you do the scaling part of it? How do you uh, how does Kubernetes does resiliency and other things? So um, 
I just want to call out again, here are the learn modules uh, from an action perspective. Uh, just take this uh, link, which is there, or the QR code. Uh, just go back. We have 92 days to complete it, but do complete it uh, so that uh, you will understand the different problems, different, uh, different issues you're going to face in terms of uh, uh, learning you know in terms of while building a microservice app uh, we will also be uh, driving these sessions in depth uh, we myself and Nish will be having a lot of discussions uh, on these uh, different topics and why it is required what it is and explain a couple of uh, things um, as well as we go along with these um, uh, specific learn modules as well and um, and this is the workshop uh, which I mentioned. So just go back and uh, you know take a look at this workshop as well. If you want to learn Kubernetes end to end, take this up. I'm, I'm happy to answer a couple of questions if there are any questions uh, specifically uh, on today's session. Uh, I'm sure uh, the next session will be uh, pretty amazing uh, with respect to building a new service and adding a new uh, service to all the list of microservices which we are running. So that will be a, a cool uh, demo as well. But uh, I'm just uh, waiting for a couple of questions. Is there any questions? Just ping your questions in the chat. So I'm happy to pick. So there are a couple of questions. Yes, so there is a question on, so how do unit test the backend images uh, if it is available behind cluster only? So uh, you can, uh, run uh, as I told you. Now I'm running uh, from a front end to back end service, right? I'm connecting to it from a front end to back end service. So that's how you can uh, build one more container and run a couple of tests behind. I mean, on from the uh, front end service. Uh, that is the setting which uh, I had done in the YAML file. If you go to the learn module and go to the YAML file, you can find that the settings has been done there. Uh, that you can do. Um, and execute it. The second question is uh, from Yesh, uh, is that uh, in the tutorial you have shown uh, us scaling up and scaling down uh, manually, but how we can do that based on some triggers? Yes, you can do that. Uh, you can always configure the YAML. As I told you, uh, most important thing is uh, the way you set up your YAML file. The moment you set up the YAML file, uh, that you are setting up the desired state. This is what I need to do uh, when you know there is a CPU usage of this much. I want to trigger more container instances. I mean, something like virtual kubelets is also there. You can use uh, as part of it, right? There is, um, you know, you can use the virtual nodes and virtual kubelets, uh, which is which is a very interesting concept as well. If you want to check it out, try it out. Uh, that's a, something which you can definitely use. Uh, in in it, it has to be configured in YAML, so that's the simplest answer for that. Um, this is a question: when, when we have limited number of pods, it's easy to deploy using individual YAML files. How does it work in a production environment with a lot of uh, interlinked pods and non-linked pods? This is a very good question. We can use Helm charts, and we are going to use Helm charts for next session. And we are going to you know spend a lot of time in terms of showing you in terms of how you can. Uh, design uh, the different microservices, how it has been structured into a YAML, uh, different YAMLs, which is which is also packaged as a Helm, Helm chart and deployed to the Kubernetes cluster just through a script uh, with all the Helm getting deployed together. So that's the uh, that's 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 a part of the next session which we are going to have. Uh, that's on February tenth, I believe. So that's uh, that's something which we will take it up then. But that's how you can do it. Uh, while you're deploying onto the uh, production, just make sure you package it with Helm. Yes. Is there any other questions coming in? I can wait for a few more minutes. While you know we are waiting for some time, you can go back and 
uh, take the survey link and event ID. Uh, there is an event ID and just check in the event ID. Uh, that's something which you can do. Um, while we are waiting for a couple of more questions to come in, I have the learn module as well. Just go check this out and make sure that uh, you take up this cloud skill challenge. And also I have this workshop, just take this workshop as well if you wanna learn end-to-end -end, uh, end -end Kubernetes as well. Okay, there is a question. Uh, currently we have done the deployment using command. Can we configure this to use deployment pipeline or Terraform script? Yes, uh, one of the in one of the session which we are going to drive in Samosa Chai in the next few, next few weeks is uh, on how to do this uh, from GitHub Actions. And uh, Terraform is more about infrastructure, uh, but what we are doing now is, is the application deployment, but you could definitely go back and do Terraform with GitHub Actions as well. Uh, you can use the pipeline and um, you can also uh, use the Terraform scripts uh, with that together. Yes, for sure. So there are a couple of strategies you can you can fall back uh, for this uh, because basically how do we differentiate different environments um, within within the uh, cluster uh, you can have different namespaces uh, the namespace is nothing but a logical uh, separation uh, of uh, the uh, logically separating the your infrastructure so in within these uh, you know different uh, clusters uh, in within the cluster you can have different namespaces and logically separate this uh, cluster into different uh, space uh, so that is why it is called namespace uh, but you i wouldn't suggest uh, keeping your dev test as a separate cluster or production as a dev separate cluster is the strategy usually followed uh, but I, I i believe that is how you should be taking up so obviously as i told you namespaces to go for so uh, just check out the concept related to namespace there So one of the question is uh, some links point to install Minikube uh, locally to host and deploy communities locally. What is preferred approach for testing cluster locally? So there is something called as uh, bridge to Kubernetes. Um, let me try and share you the link. So you can have microservices running uh, in the cluster, which is in the production cluster or in the dev cluster. Uh, and also you can use uh, bridge to Kubernetes uh, as part of the uh, way to test out your your microservices locally. So you, can, you don't have to install the complete cluster with, within your. Uh, I mean, you don't have to install all the services uh, onto onto your uh, onto your local machine. You can just uh, just pull, create a separate dev uh, dev. Uh, locally like uh, namespace locally and uh, create uh, a cluster uh, within the within the cluster you can create a bridge uh, so that you can uh, perform some test and some of the even you can make sure that uh, some of the other services can be routed to this particular test which you are running to make sure that it is all working fine and all those things so i'm just posting it in the chat just take a look at it this is the link for that uh, it's in the Visual, it's a Visual Studio extension as well. Just take a look at it. It's called Bridge to Kubernetes. Uh, let me post this link as well. This is a good one. Well, that's a good question. So, can uh, can microservice connect to uh, DB outside the cluster? It depends. You know, it's you how you want to define it. Uh, you can do it. Uh, you can also add webhooks, uh, like in the annotations. You can add webhooks and try to do that. But I would suggest to use DB within the cluster and you know connect through the cluster itself. Any more questions? I can wait for a couple of minutes. 
So while we are here, I'll also add this one. Just take the take up this challenge. Uh, a lot lot of things you will learn in this challenge. Okay, perfect. So I see no more questions coming in, but thank you folks for joining in. Um, Nish could not join uh, because of internet issues. Uh, we have, we, I mean, a lot of uh, amazing discussion, fun discussion uh, we missed uh, today, but uh, we're gonna have fun next week for sure. Uh, with with a very uh, interesting and it's going to get complex uh, from next session. The, the, this was a very simple demo, very simple one. But the next few sessions, it will be uh, a complicated discussions as well. So we're going to have a uh, discussion around, around resiliency, code resiliency, infrastructure resiliency, um, and uh, and even service mesh, a lot of things which we're going to have discussion around it. So we will see. Um, Thank you, folks, for joining in. Uh, I'm pretty excited for next session as well. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. See you.